So today's focus is on Wednesday during the week leading to the cross. And this is really the day where the betrayal of Jesus comes into focus. And yet at the same time, in the midst of this betrayal, the good news is, is that we still have hope. When Jesus is our focus, hope remains. And so while the first part of this sermon is a little bit, uh, I would say it has less of a positive outlook because we're talking about Judas, which is always difficult, right? It's never easy to really walk through and talk about his life. And yet we are going to see that in this scene and in, and in this account that there is real hope found in Jesus, even in the midst of this betrayal. Now, this, this account is included in three of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and John. And today I'm going to be using the passage from John and the passage from Mark to see what it is that the Lord has to teach us today. Now, as we see here in the beginning, uh, Jesus is here at this dinner, and the disciples are there. Mary comes and has this offering, and it is totally misunderstood. And it's not just by Judas, as, we, as you will end up seeing, that when we put these accounts together, what you see is that actually the other disciples really didn't understand it either. And so in the midst of that, they kind of follow up with Judas. Now part of it was because the disciples did not really realize the true character of Judas. They could not see him for what he was. His criticism of Mary sounded righteous enough to the others that they sort of join, her, join him in attacking her. And yet our perspective allows us to know the real reason that Judas wanted that money. And it's because he wanted it for himself. Now Judas is a tragic figure. We know this. He was called to be one of Christ's disciples. He was named an apostle along with all the others. And you know, I think sometimes we don't think about this. But in Matthew chapter 10... That's when Jesus sends them out, and he gives them all the power to heal. That includes Judas. They are all given the same from the Lord. And unfortunately, I mean, we know that if he's given the power to heal, most likely he's using it, right? I mean, I, wouldn't you use it if you had it? And yet, unfortunately, the thing is, is that that miracle, being able to perform a miracle, being able to follow Jesus and then do what he has gifted you with, does not in itself prove one's salvation. Instead, it takes the whole picture. It takes a complete picture, meaning it takes saying yes to Jesus. It means living in the word and being obedient to God's word. And then as a result, we have full transformation that allows for others to see what it means to be a true follower of Jesus Christ and have our faith fully in him. That's what it means to be a believer, not just that we can do something that the Lord allows for us to do. And so in this case, what Judas was able to do or not do is not enough on its own. Now, in spite of his affiliation with the disciples, and more importantly, his association with Jesus, Judas was not a true believer. That's the real tragedy in all of this. When he washed the disciples' feet in John 13, Jesus made it clear that one of them was not cleansed. I mean, if we really look at this, and obviously we know because we have hindsight. We know what Judas does. We know where this ends up, right? And yet, he was telling the rest of the disciples all along. He was making it pretty clear, and they just can't see it. That's, again, why when he says what he does here, that they sort of join in because they think he might be right. They're just not realizing who he really was, his true character. It's tough to hear and it's tougher to realize. But like many professing Christians, even today, Judas was among the believers. He simply wasn't one of the believers. Now, why did he follow Jesus for three years? Why did he for three years listen to his word? Why did he go along with it? Why did he go with the flow? Why did it seem like he was a part of what was really happening? 
And then, after all of that, why would he decide to betray him? This is the thing that is probably more certain than anything else, and this is what I really want you to take hold of today when it comes to Judas. He was not a victim of circumstance. He was not a predetermined tool to be used for God's plan. He always had a choice. Always. It was foretold in the Old Testament that one of the Messiah's close associates would betray him. And yet even that does not relieve Judas of his responsibility. He is not a martyr because he fulfilled prophecy. He made a clear decision to put himself before Jesus. He made a clear decision to put himself over others. And it shows he never really understood what Jesus was saying. He had free will, and he took advantage of that free will. He did what he wanted. Now, again, why does that become difficult to sort of, to sort of grasp? It's difficult because we know that God's plan was God's plan. We know that God's plan was going to take place no matter what. Now, I can't tell you what would have happened had Judas not chosen this way. But everything still would have worked out. Judas was not doomed from the start. He had a choice. Now, in saying that, we may never fully understand his mind and his heart. But we know this. During this time with Jesus, he had every opportunity, like the others, to be saved. Unfortunately, rather than letting that be his focus, Judas saw in Jesus the hope for Israel's political freedom. Now, that sounds good, and yet it's not. Because the reason that's where his focus was, was again, all about himself. What he was thinking was, at some point, Jesus is going to do what it takes to take over here. And when he does that, I'm in the financial position. I will be prominent. Yet again, it all, come back, all comes back to self. It all comes back to the fact that he thought he could take advantage of a situation. And yet... When he sees that Jesus is refusing to become that political Messiah, that's when things start to turn. And in this moment, in this moment where this waste happens in Judas's eyes, that waste and seeing that Jesus defends Mary, seeing that Jesus takes that side rather than the uh, pragmatic, logical thing that would say that this was a waste, that this was money that could have been for something else. When he sees that, he realizes Jesus isn't going to do what I was hoping he was going to do. He's not going to take charge in the way that I thought he was going to take charge. And it is at that point that Judas gives up. When we talk about this betrayal, this is really the moment where he sees and realizes this is not going the way that I thought it was. I am not going to end up where I thought I was going to end up. I thought I would just play along. I thought things would work out, but they're not going to work out. And at that point, as soon as he gives up, the idea is put in his head to turn and betray his Lord. Satan finds a willing tool and as a result, he puts the ideas into his mind, and then he enters into him to use him to, be, to betray Jesus. Judas' life is a warning to those who falsely serve Christ, but whose hearts are far from the Lord. It's also a warning to those who waste their opportunities and waste their lives. So what it comes down to this morning is where are our, where are our priorities? Where are our motives? Are we being real? Are we serving Jesus genuinely in an authentic way? Or are we simply going through the motions? Because the more we go through the motions, the more distant we become from the Lord. And the further we are from him, the easier it is to start seeing ourselves and our own priorities and our own motives and to put ourselves before other people. And the more we do that, 
Again, the distance just widens and widens and widens. And pretty soon what we find is that we're not in a relationship with the Lord at all. And Judas never was. He was in it for himself. He did not trust. He did not have faith. And what we need to ask ourselves this morning, and we're going to talk about Mary next, what we, what we need to ask ourselves this morning is, when things don't make sense, when things start to go in a direction that we don't understand, are we going to listen to the world? Are we going to listen to the people around us? Or are we going to put our trust and faith in the Lord and take the next steps that we need to, to be in a relationship with him, to honor him, to bring other people to him? Or are we simply going to give up and see where that leads? We'll talk about Mary when I get up here next time. So as we look at Mary now, that's where we're focusing a little bit more. And you'll see that obviously in that passage in Mark, it doesn't actually refer to Mary, but John does as the woman with the jar, the sister of Martha, sister of Lazarus. She's found only three times in the Gospels, and in each case, we find her at the feet of Jesus. She sat at his feet and listened to the word in Luke 10. She came to his feet in sorrow after Lazarus died in John 11. And she worshiped at his feet when she anointed him with the ointment in today's passage. She was a deeply spiritual woman. She found at his feet her blessing. She brought to his feet her burdens and she gave at his feet her best. Her worship with the precious gift she brought was an act of love and devotion that brought fragrance throughout the entire house. Now here's the difference between her and Judas. Because she had listened, she understood. Mary knew that he soon would die and be buried. And instead of anointing his body after his death, she's doing so before. She's doing so before that gets to that point. It was an act of faith and love, but it went deeper than that. Jesus commends Mary and accepts her gift. He knew the heart of Judas. He understood why the other disciples followed his bad example in the moment. But he also knew Mary's heart and quickly defended her. No matter what others may say about our worship and service, it is what Jesus thinks that matters. Meaning, if we are working to please the Lord and we take criticism for that, if we are doing it the right way, that criticism doesn't matter. Man is going to fail us repeatedly. Jesus will not fail. Now Mary gave her best in faith and love. Judas gave his worst in unbelief and hatred. He solved the problem of how the Jewish leaders could arrest Jesus without causing a riot. He sold his master for 30 pieces of silver. In other words, not only was this a betrayal, but it came cheap. Just like his relationship with the Lord was, it was cheap. It wasn't real. It wasn't authentic. So we have these two people. We have one who is as far from the Lord as possible, one who is probably as close to the Lord as possible. We have one who is completely selfish. We have one who is completely selfless and sacrificial. We have one who decides this isn't going right, I give up. And we have another who decides this is actually going exactly how he said it was going to, and I am going to give my all. It's quite the contrast. Now we know that Jesus immediately comes to Mary's defense. He does so because he protects his own. He rebuked Judas and the other disciples. He praised Mary for her act of devotion. And he did this because nothing given to Jesus in love is ever wasted. Her act of worship not only brought joy to the heart of Jesus and fragrance to the house, but also, as Jesus says, it would bring blessing to the entire world. There's a reason why he knew in that moment that we would still be talking about this. He knew that this documentation would be important and that we would know. Her devotion encourages us to love and serve Christ with our best. It's the kind of service that brings blessings to others and sometimes in ways that we will never even see until we are face to face with the Lord. 
Now, Jesus did not criticize the disciples here because he didn't want them to care for the poor. Sometimes that's very much misunderstood in this moment. But what he's telling them is that priorities need to be different right now. He's saying, there are always going to be the poor among us, and you will always have opportunity to help them. In this moment, though, you have an opportunity to worship me, and I will not always be face-to-face -face with you. He's trying to help them to understand what's really going on. And it's bizarre because the ugliness of Judas, and we know that it's ugly, we know how empty and hollow and all the things that come with what he does is. And yet on the opposite side, we see the fullness in what Mary is doing here. Now when we combine all three accounts, we learn that Mary anointed both his head and his feet. An act of pure love on her part, she knew the Lord was about to endure suffering and death. And she is lovingly taking care of him in this moment. She sat at his feet and listened to him speak. She knew what he was going to do. And it's significant that she was not later one of the women who went to the tomb to anoint his body. In a sense, it was almost as if she knew, this is my moment. This is where I can commit to the Lord and do something for him. I won't be able to later. She was showing her devotion to him before it was too late. Her act of love and worship was public, it was spontaneous, it was sacrificial, it was lavish, it was personal, and it was unembarrassed. Now, listen to those words. I want you to think about how you are following Christ today in this moment. Are you doing so publicly is it spontaneous? Is it sacrificial? Is it lavish? Is it personal? Is it unembarrassed? Are we ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Because if we're living that way, we're in trouble. What Mary is showing here is that she didn't care what the others thought. She didn't care about what it meant to give her all. She simply did it. She took the opportunity to give everything to the Lord here. Again, quite the contrast to Judas. Now, both Judas and Mary spent time in the presence of Jesus, and both are finally realizing that he's going to die. Whether or not Judas realizes it because of his betrayal doesn't really matter. But in this moment, they both know where things are headed. And they both, again, have a choice. Judas chooses to give up. He chooses to bail. And he chooses to look out for himself. Mary, on the other hand, decides that she is going to remain faithful. And she's going to continue to, pre to prepare Jesus for this journey. The biggest difference was that as a result of him being so distant and Mary remaining so close, one relationship was false while the other was authentic. I know that it probably sounds like I'm saying the same things over and over again, but we are talking about someone being in a real and authentic relationship with the Lord and being close and as a result being able to be sacrificial and give her all. And we are talking about someone else who has had him at arm's length the entire time who could never quite say yes and in the end all it ends up being about is himself. That contrast has to speak to us this morning. That contrast is powerful because it is showing us what life can be like when we are in a relationship with the Lord and we fully understand who he is, what it means to love as he loves, and what it means to give our lives over to him. If we cannot do that, we cannot live that way. And in the end, our self is going to win out over everything else. Yes, this was an expensive moment. It required a year's wages from a common laborer to purchase that ointment. And yet, Mary was not willing to give the Lord something that cost her nothing. She gave what cost her everything.
It was a beautiful act of worship brought a fra- br- which brought a fragrance to the very house in which they were dining, and the blessing of her deed again has spread through the world as Jesus said it would. When she came to the feet of Jesus, she came as a slave. When she undid her hair, something Jewish women did not do in public, she humbled herself at his feet. Now, of course, she was misunderstood. Of course, she was criticized. And that is because, again, when we are willing, without abandon, to give our all to the Lord, someone is going to be unhappy. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. We don't want to be Christians who just make people upset. We don't want to be those people where we're kind of using the Bible as a weapon. That's not what I mean by that. What I am saying is there are people in the world, there are people around us, people that we see every day who stand in opposition to our faith. And we have a choice in those moments. Are we going to be courageous? Are we going to live and operate in a way that says to the world, I don't care what you think because Jesus comes first? Or are we going to get to a place where we are ashamed, where we are embarrassed, where it is too difficult to proclaim who we think Jesus is and what our faith looks like and who we are as a result? Again, are we going to bail or are we going to say it is worth it no matter what, no matter the cost to give our all? Mary is showing us that it is most certainly worth it. And not only worth it, but she is also showing that if we are all in, that if we are saying to the Lord, I am committed to you, I love you, I want to honor you through my life, then it is easy to lay everything down, give everything over to him, and say, I am yours. Where it's difficult is if we are trying to do it in a way that is partial. If we cannot say we are all in, it's always going to be problematic. We are always going to have things of this world that get in the way. And when those things get in the way, then we start to grow further and further and further away from the Lord. I've said this to you before. It doesn't even really matter how spiritual those things are. Even the day-to-day when we sort of make things a checklist in terms of what we have to do with the Lord, for the Lord, in relationship with the Lord, even that can sometimes get in the way. What I am talking about this morning is simply authentic relationship with Jesus, where we are saying, Lord, I don't have all the answers, but you do. I am going to trust and I'm going to put my faith in you when I don't understand. I am going to live in the word and I am going to follow your instruction. I am going to be the person that you want me to be. When we are living that way, then putting everything aside and living without abandon for the Lord is possible. Mary shows us that this morning. This was a quiet evening of fellowship. And in spite of the cruel way the disciples treat her, she brought special encouragement and strength to the Savior's heart. He's facing the demands of that last week. He's facing the demands knowing that the cross is coming and he needed something and Mary provided it. Now, again, that gets... It gets a little hazy when we talk about what the Lord needs from us because technically he doesn't need anything. But he desires a relationship with us. He desires our faithfulness. He desires our commitment to him. Why? Because as Heidi mentioned before, he loves us. He loves us in a way that goes beyond any regular human understanding. And if you are questioning that right now, if you are wondering if it is possible to really be loved by Jesus and if it is possible for him to love you, know this, for all of his faults, in all of his weakness, 
in all of his pain, in all of even the dishonesty and everything else about him, Judas was loved by Jesus every day. In those moments where he is even saying, he is going to betray me, he never stopped loving him. And as a result of that love, that's what I mean when I say that Judas always had a choice. At some point, it could have changed, and the plan may have looked a little different, but Judas had a choice. He had a choice because God loved him that much. And if he can love even Judas, knowing what was going to happen, then it is easy for him to love you and to love me. His love for us is unimaginable. His love for us is overwhelming. His love for us is without abandon, and it is what should inspire us to live in that way for him. We serve a God who is faithful. We serve a God who is good. And we need to examine our own hearts. We need to examine our homes. We need to examine whether we are bringing joy to his heart, his heart through our worship, work, and witness on a daily basis. That's the challenge this morning. Are we going about it half-hearted? Are we going about it all in? Is the way we are living honoring the Lord? Is it showing others what he means to us? Is it bringing people to the foot of the cross? If not, we probably need to examine what things are getting in the way. If we are, great. Continue on. Keep going. Continue being strengthened through the word. Continue being strengthened through prayer and communication with him. And the more that our lives honor him, the more that we bring joy to his heart, the more that that desire for us to be in relationship with him, the more that his desire for us to love him becomes a reality, the more this world has a chance. The more this world can be shown what it means to live in the love of Jesus.